at uh, 5, 5 p.m. I know it's, uh, maybe we are the last talk uh, between now and going to the bar, but uh, uh, thanks for coming. And uh, thanks to the entire team for building this. We are just here to kind of representing uh, a large team at US Bank who built this, and then a couple of them are in the room. Um, and um, and then thanks thanks to the Cassandra team and the Data Stacks team also for kind of supporting us. Um, so uh, what we'll be going through is in some of the uh, you know cool mysteries that you guys have is when you swipe uh, your credit card at a you know Starbucks or something like that, and then you know how does the transaction actually show up in the mobile app or a web app? Uh, you know uh, maybe we'll answer that uh, questions and then partially at least. Uh, so I myself am Seishu Gudanti. Senior Director of Software Engineering at the U.S. Bank, and then um, Venkat. Hi. So thank you for coming, and thank you for showing interest for the session today. I'm Venkat, and I'm an engineering leader at U.S. Bank uh, with over a decade of experience. So most of my experience lies in the data space, data engineering, you know, moving data between systems. And so I've, my, my journey evolved from using leading ETL tools from the market you know, for the batch data movement to a developing of a homegrown software platform at US Bank, a software product, enabling real-time data transfer. And I have you know, delivered impactful projects for the bank. And today, migrating workflows from mainframe to Cassandra is one of them, which is our topic of discussion today. So just few 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 words about us bank and then the scope and scale of the problem that we solved uh, uh, so the problem that we saw uh, impacts consumers and then consumers are part of the consumer and business banking and uh, we offer for consumers uh, products like checking and uh, uh, um, savings and and uh, deposits and then uh, and, and loans, and then for credit cards also, uh, which is the payment service, payment side of it, we offer credit cards, and then wealth management uh, based on your net worth. Then we offer different kinds of services. So if you kind of total up all of the percentage of kind of revenues, uh, eighty percent of the uh, bank's traffic is kind of impacted by the consumers. Uh, space and and then the solution that we kind of built is for for a large uh, scale of the customers. Uh, that's on the on the sort of the scale side of it, and then you know but the other side of the equation is uh, you know the sort of the digital uh, interactions are kind of increasing at a, a high scale or or, or uh, percentage points if you look at it uh, from uh, four years ago to now. They went up by by 16% uh, on the on the digital transactions, and they went up by 20% on the on the remote remote deposits. And then it's not that uh, uh, somebody is actually encouraging them to kind of move to this digital. It's actually this trend of migrating towards digital is an across industries and across um, many different companies. And then I'll just go over some of the drivers on why actually this digital transaction or transfer, the digital interactions are increasing. Um, so one of the main reasons is that if you kind of look at it, uh, as we are all moving away from the analog version of it to the digital version, the number of interactions actually will go up. Uh, so for example, if you were uh, renting a DVD in the in the olden days with um, with a DVD in a blockbuster, you would browse for 20 minutes there and then check out one DVD and then return the DVD after three days. You would probably have three rows in the database: one for checking it out, uh, one for returning, and then one for some late fee. <laughs> uh, so if you you know add up, you know maybe three transactions. But the equivalent of that, if you are kind of browsing on a Netflix. You'll browse for 30 minutes, and then you know you'll probably create, I don't know, 50 interactions or even 100 interactions on all the movies and the reviews, and then you know who the actors are. Uh, so you'll do a lot many interactions, um, and then even same thing with uh, Kodak too. I mean, like you know, uh, if any any of you remember the old film roles, you would have like 24 or 36, but in the in the in the in the camera or in the iPhone camera world people take like hundreds of pictures. Uh, you're, so your kind of scale of interactions in the same concept, uh, even same in the bank too. Uh, you don't visit a bank uh, branch uh, as many times, you know, if you have a digital 
uh, app, you know, we would see like 10 times more transactions. So that trend is the one that is actually kind of impactful to the kind of existing infrastructure, which is kind of mainframe. So we have to move to a different infrastructure, which will support a different scale of the interaction. So that's the first problem. And the second problem is that uh, but when when customers are actually moving away from the digital transactions or or from the from the analog to the digital, uh, people want continuous engagement. And when I mean continuous engagement, again, if you go back to the uh, old days of ordering a cab versus Uber, when you called a cab, you would probably have one kind of you know interactions. But when you look at uh, ordering Uber, uh, you have to you people follow that every turn by turn. Oh, it's one minute away, five minutes away, 10 minutes away, and then you keep track of it, that. So similarly, when, when we kind of wire money, when we tr do credit card processing, people are constantly following those transactions. Uh, that means that the number of interactions that they're going to have uh, is significantly higher than in the, in, the, in the traditional days. And the last thing is, is more on the velocity. Uh, so as we are developing more uh, products and more features, uh, and, and the, selling them as bundles. Uh, there's a need for different groups to develop in parallel. Uh, and especially in the kind of the mainframe world, it was much more difficult for multiple teams to kind of operate. Uh, so we wanted to kind of uh, unleash the kind of the creativity of all of the product managers and engineers. So we wanted many different teams to work on this. And this was another driver to kind of uh, migrate away the, the workloads from um, and I'm not kind of discounting the fact that cost is a driver, but, but there are other reasons to kind of uh, move away from the mainframes. So uh, I'll go into the simple kind of the architecture kind of view of this. Uh, it's a very simplified view. So you, from a UI, there is a UI meant like it could be a mobile app or a web app or even a customer agent, a generalized version of UI. And then, you know, somebody's making a address change uh, and then it goes through a thin domain layer and the domain layer is is nothing but a security there are no business rules in it uh, and it goes to the mainframe and the mainframe has all the business rules um, uh, and then of course it returns back the data to the ui and there from the back end itself there are other batch updates that happen batch or even real time like credit card processing or ach transfers so all of them put together uh, are sent back to the ui which is about read transactions. Um, so this is a very simple uh, uh, kind of representation of the architecture. Uh, and then if you want to move away from the mainframes, what are the strategies that we typically have from this world? Uh, one is we started moving away in new domains, new domains or anything new and don't put them in the mainframe anymore. Um, well, that will take care of, I don't know, uh, some percentage of the, of the, avoidance in some sense that you're not building anymore. And the second one, which is probably the key part of the problem is the read part of it, which is in a financial services, especially, you know, you don't wake up every day and then do transactions. You, every day you wake up and mostly look at the transactions, but rather than uh, modify them. Um, so our kind of ratio to read and write is around 20 to 80%. Uh, twenty percent for write and eighty percent for read. So that's the focus of this uh, conversation, um, and how we kind of uh, migrated away the reads from the mainframe. And then, of course, we can move the non-core functionality. So all of these efforts are going on in parallel, but but the one that we're talking about is the migration part of it. Uh, and then we could migrate the core, uh, which is probably the most complex one, um, and also expensive. Uh, so. As I said, for this particular conversation, we're talking about the read part of it. So now what did we do to achieve the uh, reduction in the 80% of the traffic? And then we described the scale of the problem before uh, for 80% of the business is mostly consumer uh, focused. And then 80% of that is um, read focused. So this forms a particularly significant chunk of the bank's uh, problems. So again, starting with the, with, with the left-hand side, this is the same uh, architecture that I showed you before. So what did we do to that? Um, so we modified the mainframes to put in a uh, publisher. 
Uh, so we can kind of answer why not CDC, but, but we modified the mainframes to publish the data, a full-fledged event, uh, and then the events were published uh, to a streaming platform. Um, and the streaming platform consisted of an API abstraction on Kafka, and then, of course, Kafka. And then there was an uh, event processor, uh, Spark, and then all of this, a combination of that, which was built as a platform uh, so that we could stream all kinds of data. We had around 40, 45 events or, events or 50 events uh, just for one kind of particular project. And then all of that, we moved it to Cassandra. And then we built some of the business rules now in the new domain layer. Uh, and then not only this, when we moved the data to Cassandra, you had an opportunity to kind of enhance the data. Like today, when you go to your credit card transactions, all of them are enhanced in what it was actually years ago. So some of the enhancements, enrichments uh, happened, uh, and then we built different kind of uh, uh, services too. You can search, you can do voice search now on, 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 the, on the data that's there in Cassandra. So you can build a lot more features. Um, this is what we did. Uh, and so now we are going to go into this particular CDA pipe and, and what we did at the mainframe and then tell you some of the problems and challenges that we had. Uh, so there are like numerous problems that we encountered, <laughs> let's not be. Uh, and then here we are only listing some of them. Uh, of course, the new system, whatever we built, uh, the pipe, the Cassandra, all of them have to be reliable. They all have to scale. Uh, and, 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 and we will go into like three of them uh, because in the best interest of the time. Um, so the first one that we will get into is the data transfer. Uh, for this whole thing to be kind of meaningful, the, when the event actually happens in the mainframe, for reaching the Cassandra, it has to be less than a second. And the reason why that is kind of important is, you know, if you change an address, in the mainframe and you want to go back and then see the address, you want the address to be reflected there. Uh, same thing with transactions. You know, when today you swipe the card, it would have gone to the mainframe and then customers would kind of immediately look at it. And then if the data is now in Cassandra and, and even if there is like a I don't know, 10 more seconds delay, you are kind of degrading the customer's experience, what is today and what's, uh, you know, what we are going to propose or what we proposed or what we did. So in that sense, like we didn't want too much of degradation of what the customers actually have today. Uh, and the next one is uh, missing events. We, you know, we are a bank. Uh, even if the one transaction is gone, customers call you. Uh, even if it's one cent away, people are going to call us. Um, so we wanted to be very, very careful and then uh, build uh, systems and processes to kind of detect the missing events. Uh, and the next one is um, there are potentially problems in the events even not being published. Uh, the mainframe itself would have problems or maybe there's some business rules that kind of failed and then events. So we had to have kind of some reconciliation between the mainframes and the Cassandra uh, you know, run at a frequency. So we will get into the details on some of these problems and how we solved. Uh, and then Venkat, you want to go ahead and talk about this? Yeah. Thank you, Sheshi. Okay, so the three problems that Sheshi was talking about, latency, right? Without bringing down the one second latency, this project doesn't exist. So we have done a number of, you know, performance tests. We can see, you know, we had five, more than 500 today. So the first thing is, how do we reduce? Where is the latency, right? So we started with the mainframe. So of course, Shesha mentioned CDC. There are reasons why we do not use CDC is one of them, right? So the mainframe, you know, we, they, had, they tuned the number of threads, how many threads are listening to the events. They added, you know, more, you know, listeners, kind of more partitions when you talk about Kafka. That reduced the latency under 500 milliseconds within mainframe. So, that's one part of it. There are a number of tests we have done, but just so that's one of them. Then when mainframe published to streaming engine, of course, this is based on Kafka, Spark, and there is a Spring Boot, which is a REST API gateway for mainframe to publish. So main, it's a complete abstraction for mainframe. So they just published an endpoint. Everything was taken care of behind the scene. So the streaming engine, we are, you know, it's, it's probably processing in less than 100 milliseconds today. 
We started with the one second, more than a second. It was taking more than a second when we started with the Spark traditional D-sleeps, which is a micro batch streaming. So it was taking more than you know, 10 seconds. That's where we started when we started this journey three years ago. So of course, the Spark structure streaming came in next. And continuous streaming is one of the part of the structure streaming. That helped us. You're processing every event, you know, one message at a time. That also you know, helped us to reduce the latency. And of course, Kafka, how many number of partitions you need, you need to have the right number of partitions to speed up. So that's, you know, using the right number of partitions will also bring down the latency under 100 milliseconds. That means the moment you hit the streaming platform, the streaming box right here, we're taking 100 milliseconds, less than 100 milliseconds to write it to Cassandra. And the other important was checkpointing a destination. Here, our Cassandra is the destination. I know Spark comes up with the, you know, the fault tolerance. It comes up natively, you know, um, checkpointing to some Hadoop system or some NFS. So, but it's an external system. So Cassandra helped us. Cassandra, one of the Cassandra feature is Atomcity. So you can batch your transactions. You have the data row, you have the checkpointing, and you have, you know, there's another cable called journaling. I'll talk about that in a bit. So you can batch it and write it to Cassandra. It's, it provides very you know, low write, I mean, the high write throughput when you do that. So with that, we were able to bring down less than one second latency. There's one more thing with the, with the checkpointing. I, we, we modified some of the native Spark code that gave us full control of our checkpointing. When you want to go back and replay those events, we are not dependent on Kafka. It's completely decoupled. So you can always go back to Cassandra, update your you know, offsets. It's going to replay the events. So that's the you know, important problem that we had to solve. And moving on to the, the two problem was data loss. So data loss is, just to give an example, you, you go to UPS and ship a package. You'll be worried about, you know, hey, did my package reach? So that's why UPS gives us a tracking number. And we have that you know, confidence. We go and track that. And then when the message is delivered, you see the tracking number is updated. It's the same concept. So if you see that box journal, when mainframe publish any event, they track it. It's, it doesn't cost anything, it's just a tracking number. They're not storing the entire payload, it's just a journal table with the tracking number. And then when we, the tracking number pass along with the streaming pipe. So when you write to Cassandra, we also you know, store that tracking number. It's a, it's a short lived, three days. We kept it for three days because you will come to know if the, if the events are missing within the next 30 minutes. So what we built was, Again, using this Spark, you know, the streaming, it's not a streaming, it's a time interval batch pipeline built on Spark. Just checks every 30 minutes. You can, depending on your criticality of your data, you can change it to even five minutes, right? So what it is checking is finding out any day, you know, mainframe published a million events. Did a million events reach to Cassandra? It doesn't do any data validation. It just identifies there is a data loss. Humans, we make errors. I know we have all of the alerting enabled today. But when someone, something fails, humans make, you know, okay, he missed to address some of those, you know, events. So that usually missing a transaction in Cassandra is a big deal for, for customer. If it, if it doesn't see a transaction, it's a big deal for customer. So that's, you know, data loss. Now, if you look into carefully the box, the between mainframe, between mainframe and publish, there is an arrow, right? So when you change an address, Mainframe itself never published the data to a you know, streaming engine. Data loss doesn't tell you that because the data loss doesn't know it, no, the event never happened. So that's where the next problem that we need to solve is data reconciliation. How do you know now the data is, the writes are happening in mainframe, reads are happening against Cassandra, how do you know the data is in sync? I know we have done all the quality testing, you know, Thousands of test cases, every test case is more, you know, more, uh, validated in the lower environments before you, you know, move into production, but they're always edge cases. So as long as, you know, and, uh, as long as we're using computer systems in the world, there will always be a problems. So you need to be ready for that. So data reconciliation is an edge cases. So this is a capability, it's a product, it's a, one of the transformations, think about the, the software platform we built it. This is kind of a transformation where you can plug it into your pipe to verify the data between two systems. So this is where the mainframe on the left side, mainframe is publishing the data. And keep in mind, we're not putting burden on the mainframe. The whole model is to you know, reduce the you know, 
cost on the mainframe, reduce the misuse on the mainframe. We did not put a burden. Like any company, everyone has data lake. So it's the same concept. Mainframe is sending the data to a data lake. It's a day minus one data, that's fine. So, but we use the data lake, we use the, you know, every element and column that is published in real time. So built you know, a, a daily deconciliation pipeline, what it does is identifies three things. If, a, if you change an address, but mainframe never published that record into streaming engine. So it identifies as a missing record. Hey, there's an address change record, but it doesn't, you know, Cassandra did not get it. Another one is mismatches. So the rows and columns are compared in this. It's a very fast utility that we built, so it can process, you know, millions of records as well. So the mismatches is something, again, you know, you updated your street number, but, you know, Cassandra mainframe did not publish it. So that's one of the problem, but there are, the, the problems could be anywhere, right? In, in streaming engine, in Spark, you know, there's a memory loss that happens. Events, any events that get lost, data reconciliation is another control process that could identify proactively, you know, all the issues without creating, without impact in the customer experience. So with that said, I mean, so to just, the key takeaways are, and three years ago when we started the real time, GS Bank, we all thought, everybody thought, hey, this is impossible that you're gonna do it in one second without impacting your customer experience, but it is possible with the right, using the right technology, you know. Of course, Cassandra, Spark, and there are other tools. I'm not saying Spark is the one, but Flink is another one that could be, potentially we could even use Flink for the real time going forward, but we have Spark built with both batch and real time components, so it is solvable. And so latency is one of them, we solved it, less than one second, it's better than that. You know, it's, you know, I would say most of the 95% of the messages are under, you know, 500 milliseconds between mainframe and Cassandra. So, so I would say thank you for everyone being here and thanks to, you know, Datastax and Cassandra giving this opportunity. And of course, thanks to the team in the ES Bank, the entire team who helped us, who encouraged us, who, you know, the, all the leadership. So thanks to everyone, you know, to make it happen. And I'll open the floor for any questions. Sure. So we migrated the data and the structures in uh, in the mainframe could be different from how we stored it in Cassandra because the the mainframe structures were probably best suited for its storage system um, on how it indexes the data or whatever mechanism it is, and then we stored in Cassandra the way the reads from the from the clients would be like from the mobile app or the web app uh, so the, the the structures could be different but but the data is the same yeah so the data the model is not just one to one the db table is not one to one so yes yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, so uh, we try to we use solar. The simple answer is yes. yes. Uh, the complex answer is uh, uh, relative to the most of the use cases would be based on the key. Uh, we have a customer key uh, and account keys, and then so you can actually retrieve uh, when the user logs in, in in a bank. At least we clearly know who, you, who who the user is and what account they're kind of related to. So we can pull the exact data. But there are some edge cases or, or less percentage of the use cases where search is kind of uh, uh, needed and search was provided. Um, but for that, the, the latency is actually slightly more higher uh, for the solar to kind of re-index. Uh, so there, there's kind of difference. So we, we have to kind of carefully orchestrate the searches 
in such a way that the customer doesn't search, uh, insert into the mainframe and search within the next second, and then you know uh, it may or may not exist. Some of the like not critical functionality, like voice, right? So it's not customer is expecting, you know, high the low latency in that. So the solar is used kind of voice in such use cases, but not in the you know when you log into a mobile app and want to see transactions, it's all key based, and now provides the you know the low latency. Uh, yes, it comes with it, but uh, there is a, uh, if you insert into kind of uh, Cassandra, then, you know, of course the data is there, uh, persistent, but for re-indexing of the solar or indexing of solar takes few extra seconds. So that's not counted in the, in the, in the budget of one second. <laughs> that's what I meant. So it may take two seconds, but, but yeah. Sure. It's in the billions. Yeah. Billions. Uh, yeah. Right. I think the peak it depends, right? The peak traffic with the 300 TPS we, you know, uh, during the business hours. So for the one second, I mean, 95, the ways, I'm not saying 95 percentile, but what we measured is if you have a thousand messages in that second, right? 95 messages are, you know, we proved that it is writing under one second. There's always spillover, right? And that we cannot, the spillover is not in minutes, but at least it's in, you know, extra more than a second. So we have alerts enabled, anything about you know, less than 95, tell me why, right? So sometimes, you know, mainframe might be publishing a little late, so, and sometimes it's a C, in the streaming pipe, it's a little delayed, Kafka lag and all of that. So, yeah, yeah we have fine-tuned this over uh, some, some few months, uh, maybe even a year, uh, and, and to Venkat's point, uh, we have made sure that 99, percent of the 99 percent of the events, not the percentile, 99 percent of the events uh, are within the, the one second. Yeah. And as we said, we kind of fine tune the number of threads on the mainframe to partitions to kind of the technology of the event processor to the checkpointing. So lots of effort have been gone there. Uh, but, so that, that's almost, uh, you know, uh, without which, like as, as we said, there's no reason to build it, so we built it to make sure that it, we meet that. Yeah. Sometimes it even matters, Spark on VMs, you know, which disk you're using, you're using SSD or the, for the garbage collection, all of that. Even if we went to that level, Spark is better if you use SSD, but, you know, not on the virtual desk. Guarding that? No, that it, it's not the security concerns. Uh, sometimes what happens is uh, when, when the data gets written, I mean, I'll just give yeah. maybe one best data point, but when you write to some of the mainframes, for example, the, the event doesn't get published. Uh, it could be whatever, maybe they, they, it, it kind of, you know, uh, crashed or run, or maybe not crashed, but for, we don't know the exact reasons, but let's assume it didn't write it. Uh, so the, the data loss won't catch it uh, because nothing was actually published. Uh, but the batch export from the mainframe would have that record uh, and you will not have a corresponding record of that in Cassandra, then we know that, hey, yes, the data recon. Uh, that's again, what happens is when we kind of, I don't know, when we went to production, say on day one, the data recon will produce, I don't know, a thousand errors, yeah. uh, but you fix all of those edge cases, uh, and then, you know, now if you look at it, maybe you'll have 10, and then we constantly keep fixing it, uh, and then hopefully there'll be a day when data recon is kind of not needed, but but of course we need that as an insurance. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's not for 
not all of your data is wrong. Think about that. Right? Yeah. If all of your data yeah. is wrong, that is, you'll, you'll come to know immediately like that, right? So it's a subset of customers, right, is impacted. Maybe just one of the product that we offer, just making it up in a money market. So there's something wrong with the money market data. We know how, exactly how many customers are, have a money market accounts. And this could identify, it's like, when you cook rice, right? you don't, you're not checking every piece of it. You just check like that. So it's the same thing. Data reconciliation is a sampling. So the moment you identify, to identify the issue, we can quantify what all the impact are customers, and then we can quickly react to it. So and it can practically you know, can be fixed as well. Good. So uh, I mean that's not the at least I mean we. This project is not driving that, uh, but as we told that 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 uh, you know there are uh, uh, what's that new domains are being built outside. Uh, we are migrating the reads. Uh, the reason why the mainframes are far or at least in the thought process wise, say we acquired another bank, uh, the the rights itself are going to go up. Uh, yes, we, we kind of drained out all the reads, but but the rights actually went up because we are actually doing more customers now. Uh, so the, the goal is not to kind of replace it, but augment it in such a way that we are actually kind of doing different kinds of services and also serving uh, uh, more volume or interactions to the customer, which you know were probably cost effective or less cost effective on the mainframe versus. So think of it as that way, and then you know. Maybe there is some future at some point where, you know, the core will be migrated, but that that's that's not the kind of line of sight for us. Yeah, all the transactions that, that you swipe your card, ACH transactions, money movement transactions, and all of that. Yeah, go ahead. You had a question. Okay. Okay. All right. Time's up apparently. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you guys. Let's hit the happy hour. Yeah. <laughs>